Hi, this is Shifa Bradigan, and this is Shifa's Magic Alcove. So, after our discussion on our live feed last Sunday on the 7th, and since Valentine's Day is coming up on our next live feed on the 14th, uh, it seemed appropriate to do a video about the different kinds of love and love as an energy as a feeling and as an emotion and how you can tell the differences between them. So I guess we'll see where this goes. <laughs> so the first kind of love I want to talk about is probably the kind that's most common as far as where people are at and what they're learning about. And that would be love as an emotion. Love as an emotion comes in uh, as a a drive to connect with others um, and it has a lot of passion and all that other stuff involved with it. It also usually has a lot of projection when it's coming from that center, that chakra. So if it's coming from the hara, uh, it is intense, uh, quick, uh, often doomed <laughs> because of the projections and things that are associated with that. Because generally speaking, when we're coming from that particular energy center, it's all about us. It's not about the other person. It's more of a self-absorbed, self-centered kind of relationship. And, you know, we all go through that. <clears throat> not that it's a bad thing in and of itself, but it is different than the other expressions of love. We use the word love to describe so many different types of relationships, it makes it very confusing. I mean, the Greeks had different words that they used to describe the different kinds of love on the physical plane, but then, you know, there's other planes as well. So I'm not sure exactly how to approach the subject the easiest way. So I thought about the chakras and going up there and seeing where things lead. Um, I know for me, for me, certainly in the beginning, I was, I just des would describe what I was looking for as something outside of me to fill something inside of me. And now I see that as like a, a gap, a hole, a black hole, um, something missing in me that pushed me to find something outside of me to fill it up with. And I know that it is not sustainable because if you have that sense inside of you that there's this empty space that needs to be filled up with an other, you know, to get validation from someone else, um, to be projected back from them, to see your own reflection in what they do and how they act and so forth to you, then you're dealing with uh, a broken uh, part of yourself and not really seeing the other person. This happens in almost in many relationships, if not most relationships, where people aren't clear. Being clear takes a lot of work and it's not an easy state to attain. And so it's not an uncommon experience for people to have, which is one of the reasons why we make poor choices when we make poor choices that's it's based on the emotion of what what we're experiencing and on that drive to find that other us in someone and we've come up with all sorts of different ways of trying to describe that the search for the soulmate the other the <clears throat> the twin flame or what have you and i consider most of those things are are just attempts at at trying to make sense of those types of relationships to give them a purpose that they may not deserve frankly to have uh, and victim blaming comes in a lot with a lot of this kind of language it's like if it doesn't work it's your fault it's you know um you've done something wrong we blame ourselves for a lot of things that really aren't at, we're not at fault for 
specifically. So that's a muddy kind of relationship. And if you come from an abusive background like I did, and I know that there's a fair number of you that are subscribers at this point that do, it makes it even more complicated because the psycho psychological dynamics of trying to find that externalization of the figure that isn't capable of loving you in another in order to fulfill that with need and on, on an unconscious level. Um, there's that. And then there's also what I've come to discover is an addiction to adrenaline because when you live in an environment of abject terror for long enough, your fight or flight patterns get completely scrambled and your adrenal glands are overloaded and you know, you're, you're literally become addicted to your own adrenaline because it is a powerful drug. That's the reason why we have it. And that's the reason why it's only supposed to be used in extreme emergencies, like running from a wild animal that's about to eat you. It's not supposed to be your daily existence and what you have to, to do all the time. And the pattern for that kind of relationship is going to be needing to fight, finding reasons to fight, and then making up. We see these types of relationships modeled on TV shows all the time, so that doesn't help. Because, you know, they normalize that as like, this is the way things work. This is the way they're supposed to. I don't know how many movies I've watched where the two main characters, mostly male and female, uh, hate each other in the beginning, fight like crazy, and then they end up together, which is not that good of a foundation for a long lasting relationship. Frankly, it's, it's absurd, really, that that's what we're looking for. Um, I don't know if it's the idea that changing their mind and making them decide that you're actually what they want is the juice that runs it or the addiction to adrenaline. And when Ian and I first got together, um, I was starting to really understand the whole adrenaline connection with my own relationships and uh, in the past. And we started living together, and then there was no fighting, no arguing. Some discussions that were kind of intense, but they were communicative, not argumentative. <coughs> and uh, I started wondering what was wrong with the relationship. It's kind of humorous in retrospect because I'd never been in a relationship where I wasn't having to defend myself, fight for my right to speak or have an opinion, um, fight for my children, uh, fight for my survival on one level or another, always having to worry what I said might, you know, be the one thing that will tear it all apart and destroy the world, not having to walk on eggshells, and that lack of, of that constant adrenaline rush at first is like a numbness. Because the comparison, if you're always on this level up here and that's your normal constant activity level and mental state and so forth, and you suddenly drop down to where really we should all be in a non-combative, non-threatening environment. The comparison between those two is so startling that for a while it's like, what is this feeling? I didn't know, really. It was difficult to comprehend what this feeling was and uh, that safety was a good thing and that I, you know, it definitely took some getting used to. So I lucked out when it came to Ian and I getting together. Not that we are perfect, of course, because we aren't. We're 
human with all of our little foibles and quirks and all the other stuff that makes us up as unique individuals. But yeah, so that was <clears throat> that was an adjustment to go from the emotional center to the heart center. And that's what I would call the feeling of love, expressing itself as a feeling. And as a feeling, it's not, it doesn't project out onto someone else to make them fill you up. It's more a place where you have filled yourself up to that point where you're capable of accepting that kind of uh, positive attention, really, and acceptance of who you are. I mean, that's what we're all wanting, is to have someone accept us for who we are. And all of the things that happen in our society seem to be poised around that notion uh, that we're not being accepted for whatever reason it happens to be. And a lot of them are very valid reasons that shouldn't be, you know. Um, I think that comes from the other people projecting themselves onto the people around them and freaking out because they're different. I don't know. It's complicated. That's all there is to that. But getting into that feeling and uh, a comfortable companionship, a lot of times they have those uh, personality bubbles or relationship bubbles that they like to show people, the circle. <clears throat> and the ideal relationship is basically where this is me, this is him, and the stuff that's really important to us sort of overlaps a great deal. And then there's this part of us that's different, which adds energy and interest to a relationship. If we were identical, we wouldn't be unique individuals. and that would not be a positive relationship. That would be weird. Um, but when you're looking to decide if you want to be in a relationship with someone, it's important to know what are the things that are deal breakers for you. And when you see those red flags that are the deal breakers to, you know, stop and go and you know somewhere else in our societies various societies out there really like to uh, blame us if things don't work out and uh, we take on the notion of being failures and all the other stuff that goes along with that so it's a uh, annoying but this is the reason why love spells are a bad idea because if you want to actually get to the kind of love where you're a companion with someone, um, you can't start off with the idea of, I like that person, I'm attracted to that person, that's the person I want, but for some reason they're not interested in me because then you're going from this emotional state again, where like with the movies, where the main characters hate each other's guts and then fall in love, which is not really love. So, on this path, one of the things that we're committed to doing when we follow this kind of a path is clearing out our own stuff so that we are a better version of ourselves, the best version of ourselves that we can be at any stage that we're at. And it doesn't make it easier, that's for sure. I mean, all of these things are very intense when they're happening. And when you're younger, those uh, the emotional side of love is much more intense because it's combined with the primal drive of procreation and and then societal pressure on top of that, sometimes family pressure, cultural pressure, whatever it happens to be, you know, where if you don't fall within certain guidelines, um, then you are failing as a human. My mother, when uh, I became a teenager, took me aside one day to tell me the secrets of having a boyfriend. And they were all about manipulation. Everything she told me, there were never win a game with a boy because they really don't like it when you win. 
Um, and I couldn't understand that because I figured if you're better than they at that one thing or have more luck that time, then that's good, you know. Why would that be bad? And this whole notion that men have fragile egos and they can't stand the idea of losing to a woman because a woman in this scenario is actually a lesser being. And so that means that if they lose to a lesser being, then they're less than the lesser being they lost to. And that brings up all kinds of, you know, stupid stuff. All that historical layer of things that are added into the package. And, uh, and also I got the distinct impression between the movies that I watched, the books that I read, uh, and conversations with my mother that my whole purpose in existing was to find a man, marry him, and have children, and that was it. That was like the only goal that was worthwhile for me. So that was weird. Like when I got married by the first time, I was like, okay, I'm done. I did it. I got a guy. Now there's nothing for me to do. <laughs> I got bored pretty quick with that because <laughs> so, I'm a curious individual, so that didn't last. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting process to look through lens the lens of time and, and be able to see things because I'm far enough from them emotionally and in the sense of the time that has passed that it's easier for me to see those patterns in myself. <clears throat> so working on yourself is the best way to find a real relationship because if you don't know who you are you don't know what you're offering you don't know what's important to you if you haven't defined yourself and decided what are the deal breakers there's no there there's no way to take make a judgment call about someone else and women are often trained to not hurt anybody's feelings. That's kind of one of the things that culture tries to teach us in so many different ways out there. And so, you know, uh, protecting people from the truth or reality or things that might hurt their feelings makes it difficult to be upfront and succinct in what is and isn't okay and that kind of thing. And again, that goes back to the whole victim blaming because somehow it's a woman's fault if a man is having a, a hard day. It, there's just so many different layers. Again, the emotional versus the feeling. So when you can when you can actually get to that point where you can find somebody who's close enough on the same page, who's also on the same path of self-discovery and has enough of those important things that are of essential to the character of the individuals you know those important things need to match it's complicated so that's the first thing to do is to sit down and figure out what those things are you can do it as a writing exercise you know and make a list of not the qualities you want in another person but the things you aren't willing to have in your life. And that will define the qualities that you want in another person. So if, you know, uh, abusing children is a bad thing, which we would hopefully assume is a bad thing for everyone, that would be on your list, you know, um, how they treat other people. And if they treat you the same as they treat other people, that's a weird one. Because I've seen that too, where somebody will be much kinder, nicer, more attentive to total strangers than they are to the person that they're with. In fact, that was my second marriage uh, when I had my daughter. Uh, one of the things that Rick would say when he came home and got frustrated and punched a hole in the wall would be that he wanted to be able to relax at home and not have to worry about everything that he said and not have to monitor the words that came out of his mouth and that this should be his safe space. And I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, 
in the world of relationships, to me, the primary relationship, the home is the most important relationship. And that should be the person that you pay the best attention to and that you're the most careful with their feelings. So that was a huge gap. And, you know, it was pretty clear. We really weren't meant to stay together. And then there's those things where um, I, I'm very much into keeping promises. They're very important to me. And I had a hard time with that one when I finally realized I was in a relationship with the wrong person um, the second time. The first time was a little bit easier since he went to prison. So that kind of gave us a obvious gap and <laughs> time for me to sit, sit with myself and and decide, although he did his best to manipulate me from prison. But, uh, but you know, realizing that um, it wasn't what I wanted and wasn't okay with me to be treated that way um, and help me make my decision to leave. Of course, with Rick, it was the violence, uh, constant shouting, the punching of holes in the wall, violence against me in his mind, even if he didn't hit me, but he hit the wall kind of thing. And that's just not okay. He got mad at crazy, crazy things all the time. Things that I thought were crazy anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was very good at accidentally making him mad. <laughs> he talked to me one day about how his, uh, I guess one of his coworkers' wife made him lunch every day. And I didn't make Rick lunch because I made everyone breakfast and I made lunches for the children to take to school and I cooked dinner and I figured, you know, the least he could do was make his own lunch while I was busy doing everything else. And uh, and I quipped, well, maybe you should marry her instead. <laughs> and he just flew off the handle. But um, nothing is simple or straightforward. It doesn't matter what path you're on. That kind of stuff is complicated. And getting to the point where I decided if that was my only option, if the only option for being in a relationship was being with someone who was like that, who was trying to change me, mold me, manipulate me, um, torture me emotionally, torture my children physically, taking control because of a lack of self-worth in him, I can only assume um, that you know, that's that harkens to that video we did on power over, power under, power with. And I've always been a more inclined to power with before I even knew the term. And he was definitely into the power over, power under. He was on top, we were below. Uh, I was below him and then the children were below me. There was this decided pecking order. And uh, I've talked to my children about my own behavior during that time in my life and apologized to them. And, you know, let them know that I recognized that I was not doing very good parenting at the time. And uh, there was no excuse for it. And if they ever needed to talk to me about it, I would be there and I would listen and help process through it. Which, of course, meant they never had to do that because I acknowledged it right up front. So that was helpful. But uh, getting from that kind of a place with all those experiences up into a place where that kind of stuff wasn't happening was like I said, a shock. It was very different. It was so completely different. And so it took a while for me to get accustomed to the idea that I didn't have to constantly fight to maintain my integrity, um, myself, my person, or whatever. He liked me for who I was, and he loves me for who I am. And it's okay to change as we grow and learn more and come to deeper understandings of things. At a funny thing, I had never really been in a relationship for longer than five years. That was my calculation anyway. And when we hit the five year mark in our marriage, um, I started freaking out. I started having all these thoughts that he was fooling around on me and, you know, seeing other women behind my back or, you know, he was gonna like break up with me and everything was gonna be destroyed. I, I hit this 
anniversary thing, uh, an anniversary time bomb I didn't know was there, which is like really funny. And I recognized it, so that was good. And I told him because I looked at that logically and I'm like, well, I know where he is 24 hours a day. <laughs> There's no way he could do any of these things. So what is this? And, and that's one of the tricks of a healthy relationship is being able to identify the things that are going on in your head that are not theirs, but yours and dealing with them for yourself instead of making them have to deal with it for you kind of thing. So I just basically told them, I said, okay, here's what's going on. Um, I've never lasted longer than five years and I'm freaking the hell out. This is probably going to last for a few months and when nothing happens, then everything will go back to normal, which is what it did. So, you know, again, it doesn't matter how long we've been at this kind of stuff. We have things to process and things to go through and things will come up and different stages will happen. So those are the, the more distinctive differences between those two kinds of love as a descriptor. And then there's a third one, which is love the energy. And Moid is the one who introduced me to that when I was channeling. And, you know, she stated numerous times that love was the energy that created the universe. Everything in the universe, all parts of life from microbial and upwards and inorganic as well as organic life is all created from the energy of love. And so there's no anti-love. I mean, we have these scenarios that we cook up as humans where we're always having to have things fight each other there's always some kind of a conflict in everything not just between people but between forces dark versus light good versus evil and all that other stuff and in reality the universe isn't set up that way there's different states of being that are transforming from one to the other it's much more accurate to think of the uh, the tai chi symbol the yin and the yang um as being Part of a whole and there's not one that's bad and one that's good they're just in constant shifting from one kind of energy to another state of energy and then back and I think that's one of the secrets of good magic really when it comes down to it is uh, being able to hold two apparently opposing forces in your mind at the same time and see how they're connected so one of the methods that I've used to try and help me with the understanding of that idea, um, the holding of things in opposition. Uh, the medicine wheel ceremony talks a lot about the center of the wheel. And most of us are on the outside of the wheel. And even in our own lives, we are on the outside of our own wheel. We're not in the center of our wheel. Because if you have something in the center of the wheel, and you have all these people on the outside looking at it, then everyone is seeing a different part. This is a more complex version of the six blind men with the elephant, but I think an easier version really in a lot of ways. Everyone is seeing whatever it is that's in the center from a different side, a different perspective, a different point. But the thing in the center is itself, regardless of who's looking at it and where it is. So if you can get yourself into the center of your own medicine wheel, your own universe, then you can look out from that center spot and then that's integrating your personality, integrating your life, integrating your magic, and, and everything becomes a part of that core instead of being, you know, pieces. We have the different faces that we use to interact with different people that are in our lives. We have a different way of talking and walking at work versus at home. <clears throat> and sometimes that leads to sort of a disjointedness in our personality because, you know, it can feel fake and sometimes be fake. But if you can do the same thing from the center and always be true to yourself, I've had some interesting experiences with being able to do that with people who say something to me that is just so totally outrageous, I can't believe they're talking. And I keep listening because, uh, you know, people tell me stuff because they think I'm non-judgmental, which in general I'm not, but I still have my own critical thinking faculties. And I look for whatever it is in what they're saying that I can agree with, and then I agree with that. 
one of the things I have noticed in conversations and relationships is if someone tells you something that's sort of crazy and outrageous and you don't say anything back, they assume that you agree with whatever they've said, which can be a good survival tactic. And I'm not opposed to using that in a situation where I feel that, you know, my person might be at risk if I let the other, whoever they are, know what I really think and feel. But if you want to be in a relationship with that person, there has to be room for how you feel about it and have that be okay. Um, Mixed religions is often one of those difficulties that people can have because religion or spiritual beliefs is often one of those big things in that circle uh, to have being different. And of course, there's lots of others, but that's one of the ones that, that people often end up with. We actually know a couple where the man is a magician, witch, pagan, and the woman is a Mormon. And they have mixed their two belief systems without any difficulty. They have Jesus and Kernu Nos on the wall together. Um, and they are able to accept one another for where they're at, and it's not a fight. Like, the fight comes in when the person who believes in something feels threatened when someone else doesn't believe in the same something. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with holding out for the person who has similar enough beliefs so that that's not a struggle that you have to deal with, in my opinion, anyway. But uh, but personalities and the way we interact with things, it's like, you know, I am different when I go grocery shopping or am talking to a client in my office or doing a video, um, doing the on live stuff. I'm always myself as one of the things I have gained this process that no matter what I'm doing I am always still me but I can relate to, to uh, situations different ways depending on what I feel is needed at the time and and not feel that conflict like I'm not being true to myself that's that idea again of being in the center of that wheel um, and one of the reasons I'm doing the videos is so that I can share not just what I've learned, but some of the reasons we do some of the things that we do and why we do them that way. Because if you don't understand why we're, we do certain things a certain way, there's no reason to do them, you know? Like, doesn't necessarily make any sense. So, so the path itself is really a lot about making those kinds of choices and decisions. And the way I see it, like you're walking your life and you come across something, whether it's a piece of trash on the road, whether it's a person who might need help, whether it's a tree limb that fell off during a storm, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's there and you see it, then you have to make a decision of what to do. Walk by it, leave it where it is, decide that there's no reason to interfere in the process, pick it up, throw it somewhere else so that it's not going to harm someone else, you know, like the wind's not going to pick it up and throw it through a windshield and kill somebody, whatever it happens to be. But but that's what our lives are, these constant um, making of choices as we pass through this physical reality that we're in and what we learn from that. And what will we take with us when we get to wherever we're going on the other side of death? So, yeah, there's a um, a story that uh, Ian came across, I think, in one of his Zen books that is really appropriate to the need to understand why things are done a certain way and not just doing them because someone else said so or did so. So there's like a master, you know, at one of these places in India or wherever, and he's got all these students. He's enlightened. They want to know what he knows. They're just yammering at him day and night, constantly asking him questions and want to know what's this, what's this, what's this, what's this. And he's getting kind of tired of it. And he wants to go away from everybody and just take a bit of a break. 
So he sneaks out of the ashram first thing in the morning, goes down to the river, takes off his clothes, puts them on the beach, and then piles some rocks on top of them so they don't fly away and so he can find them when he's done with his bath. And then he gets into the river or the lake or whatever to, you know, wash himself and commune. One of his students sees that he's sneaking out um, of the ashram and follows him down to the river and gets there after he has taken off his clothes and put the piles up. All he sees is a pile of rocks on the beach and the master is in the water. So he's pretty confident that this is some kind of a secret, you know, a secret ritual or passage of some kind of extreme significance, very, very important. And, and he has now found out about it. So he runs back to the ashram and he tells everybody else, hey, I discovered this thing that our teacher is doing and we should surprise him and go and do it too. And so they all sneak out of the ashram, go down to the river while he's off doing his thing, out of sight apparently. And they start trying to match his pile of rocks. So they stack them all up and he gets back to the beach and there's like a hundred piles of rocks. He does not know under which pile his clothes are because there's only one pile that has his clothes. So that to me is like the perfect story to explain why it's a bad idea to do things we don't understand. <laughs> we don't know why. If the student had seen him taken off his clothes and piling the rocks up, he probably would have gone, oh, okay, um, this is a private moment and I should leave him alone. But, so I like that story for that reason. And we had that happen in our temple uh, during one of our rituals. We have a chant, Garuda chant, that has some hand motions that go with it, and we repeat it nine times. And so I'm leading it, <clears throat> and I've already taught the hand motions, so I thought, to everyone else. And one of the members is watching me, and, and I'm doing weird things with my fingers because I'm counting, you know, because nine times. It's like I, I use that hand and then that finger, and, you know, go like that and until I get to nine, and I'm done. So one day she starts asking me about these other strange gestures that I'm making when I'm doing this. And I'm, I start to laugh because they only mean something to me. There's just a way for me to count uh, when I'm standing up and throwing my arms up in the air and doing all the other stuff. So, yeah, it was a, a good story for that. And, uh, and so that's just one of those little things. It's, it's when... When you guys asked me to do the video on the hexes and curses and stuff, and I got the information from that book, and then, you know, I had my suspicions. So thank you for confirming my suspicions that a lot of those things were not uh, documented in any way whatsoever because they did seem to be kind of short. That sort of brought that to mind, um, that whole idea. So if... For me, if the universe is all created out of love, and love is the energy that is behind all of creation, I think that that is what is that part of me, the, the quiet place inside where I take one of those things, like should I pick up the stick, or you know, should I throw away the garbage, should I move this item, whatever it is, and I, I take the action I'm thinking of doing and I show it to that spot inside that's connected to that energy. And if it increases life, it makes it better, it moves it in a direction that seems like a good direction, then it's a good thing to do and I do it. And if it decreases it and takes it downward in a not a good direction, then it's a not a good thing to do and I don't do it. That doesn't mean it's always right or that I'm always right about that, but that's just something I've always had with me, um, which has helped even in all the confusion. I mean, when I was little, I thought there was something seriously wrong with me, that the universe just hated me to put me in this terrible place and being so tormented all the time that, that it was somehow my fault. And so I'm glad I've evolved out of that.
and realize that everyone has their part. Um, that's their fault, not always mine. And taking on someone else's uh, guilt doesn't help you at all in any way whatsoever. But not taking responsibility for what is yours doesn't help you either. So there's a fine line in there, you know. But anyway, the nice rainy day today, it's all drippy outside. We're going to have rain for probably a week. And uh, I have to say I'm glad to be on this end of things at this point and not stuck in the middle of all that stuff that happened to me when I was younger and adolescent and young adult and all the relationship stuff and trying to understand and figure it out. Ian and I are definitely lucky that we found one another and we just fit together really well and give each other room to grow. So that's a good kind of love in my opinion. Sorry about the rambling because this is not one of those things that has a distinct beginning and a distinct end. It's like, how the hell do you talk about this? I don't know. <laughs> Exactly. I just know I have a, I know that there's a difference. I'm trying to express what that difference might be. But uh, <clears throat> so I hope all of you are having a good week. I got my second COVID vaccination and did not have a bad reaction at all. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. And uh, with that was on the 9th. So I guess by the 23rd, I'll be fully protected. So awesome. And hopefully we'll be coming out of this dark point in uh, the world as we know it and come out fresh and new, <laughs> different, having learned all so much, or whatever. So anyway, I guess I'll stop rambling at this point and send me your questions and we can talk about whatever other aspects of love you want to question. If you have any questions on Valentine's Day, and uh, and see what we end up getting into. So, this is Schieffer's Magic Alcove, and this is Schieffer Bradigan, blessed be.